you know, when you think about vision and think about the future. One of the things you have to think about before we can look into the future of where has God taken us? And I was thinking about commitment this week. As we're talking about a healthy church, can we move into the future with a healthy environment without a solid commitment? Not a commitment to me and not a commitment to Glenville, but a solid commitment to God. Because I believe everything rises and falls on our commitment to the one that saved us and a commitment to the one that's going to keep us in the most difficult times within our life. And if you are anything like me, there's a disciple in the Bible that best tells the story of Bruce Thomas and probably many of you. And that's the disciple by the name of Peter. That disciple by the name of Peter, he, 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 he lives a life of passion, but also utter failure. But also, out of utter failure, he gets raised up in complete forgiveness. And the roller coaster ride of Peter's life is just like us. There's a story that you all know so well about the denial of Jesus. Three times he denied Christ. If I could paint the picture for you, it was the last night on a Thursday night, and Jesus was up in the upper room, and he was talking to his disciples, and he was telling his disciples that I have to drink a cup, that I don't know what's going to take in store. I don't know necessarily what's going to happen but I know it's going to be a bitter cup, and I need you to go with me. And they left the upper room, and they went into the Garden of Gethsemane. And he just asked the men to pray. And after a few hours in the midst of the garden, Judas came with the soldiers of the temple to betray Jesus. Pilate was in the courtyard waiting to have rule. John, James, and Peter were sitting praying right outside. The other disciples were at the entrance of the Garden of Gethsemane. The stage is set for a climactic event that will change the world. Judas comes walking into the garden with the flames of torches. Jesus, raising up from prayer, sees them coming. His disciples standing around. Peter takes his sword out of his sheath and cuts off Malchus's ear. Jesus, hey, no, Peter. We're not going to live by the sword because if we live by the sword, we're going to die by the sword. Jesus reaches down and heals Malchus's ear. And then all of a sudden, the chaos starts. The disciples started to run. Jesus was held inbound all the way to the courtyard of Caiaphas. Pilate, waiting in the upper room, just waiting to see what was going to take place. Peter and John, they follow from a distance. They're wondering what's going to take place. You got I remember for the last three years, they witnessed the miracles of Jesus. They witnessed the healing. They witnessed Lazarus being raised from the dead. The storms being calmed. They knew Jesus was the Son of God. But yet they did not stand up. They followed from a distance. And this is what is so unique to the story of Peter. And it's, it, it, when you look at it, it's found in Luke chapter 22, Let's start with verses 54 to about 62, and then we're going to go back and take some other pic uh, pictures of some other stories. And it says in verse 54, So they arrested him and led him to the high priest's residence, and Peter was following from afar. The guards lit a fire in the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter joined them there. The servant girl, a little servant girl, noticed him in the firelight. And began staring at him. Finally, she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers. Peter denied it. 
Woman, he said, I don't even know the man. And after a while, someone else looked at him and said, You must be one of them. No, man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, someone else insisted, This must be one of Jesus' disciples because he is a Galilean also. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And as soon as he said that, the words, the rooster crowed. And at that moment, at that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered what the Lord said. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will have denied me three times. Then Peter left the courtyard crying bitterly. Crying bitterly. And the guards in charge of Jesus began mocking and beating him. Jesus, for the last three and a half years, was the rabbi, was their college professor. He sat and talked and taught them everything about God, everything about the kingdom of God, everything that they were going to go through and what they had to do. In this courtyard, it was probably a two and a two and a half hour trial. They were between Annas and Caiaphas' house. And there was a courtyard in between. Peter and John was in the courtyard. Peter and John were following from a distance. And they got access into this courtyard. And all of a sudden, all around the courtyard, the soldiers were cold. So they built a fire. And in that fire in that courtyard, it started to illuminate light. And in that light, they saw something. They saw men that followed him. A little servant girl said, aren't you, aren't you one of those guys that I saw at the temple with Jesus? Just a few hours earlier, the head of the captain of the priests, Malchus, Peter was ready to cut his head off. He would stand up for Jesus just a few hours ago in front in the face of death. But then they saw what they did to Jesus and he ran. And now he would stand in front of Malchus and defend Jesus. But a little servant girl that made no difference at all would stand up and confront, and he would deny. After that, I'm sure that people started looking at him and started talking. So I'm sure Peter went to the back end of the courtyard, probably under some stairs in the shade, because he was confused between the devotion and the love of Jesus and the fear of what was going to take place. But he got cold. So he remembered the fire that all the soldiers were standing around warming up. So he makes his way back to the fire to warm himself. And another girl said, Sure, I know you. You, you are a follower of Christ. And again, he said, I don't even know the man. Leave me alone. He falls away. But he was so captivated for the love that he had for Jesus, but the fear for himself, he could not leave. He could not. Even if he wanted to, he couldn't leave. And then one of the soldiers themselves stood up and said, you are a follower. You're a, you're a, a Galilean. I can tell by your words. I can tell by the way you look. And he says, you are crazy. And in John, he even said he cursed and swore that he was not a follower of Christ. He cursed and swore. In other words, he said, tell God that God will prove to you that I am not a follower of him. And then as soon as he said that, the rooster crowed. And as soon as the rooster crowed, Jesus, not with angry eyes, but those penetrating deep eyes, turned and looked straight at Peter. Peter's heart broke because his Lord, the one that sued you are the rock, and upon this I will build my church, just denied him three times. And the Bible says that he went out to a private place and he wept bitterly. 
He openly poured his heart out and said, I have failed God. How could I be part of a grand church if I can't even stand up for my Lord in private in front of non-significant little girls? How can I stand up and be a proclaimer of God and proclaimer of the church? How can I do what God has called me to do if I have denied him three times? And I believe sometimes those penetrating eyes, those times where we know what God has done within our life and we know that we have failed and we see God in our hearts and we see those penetrating eyes looking deep within our soul and we know that we have failed miserably. But see, that's part of the story. We can't understand the depth of the bitterness that he had within his heart until we go to the first part of that chapter, starting in verse 31. Let's see what happens there. Peter was talking. He was talking to Jesus. And the arrogance and the pride of Peter. He was saying, I'm better than all these other disciples. All these other disciples will leave you, but I will never leave you. And then Jesus, knowing what was going to take place, said something to him that penetrated deep within his soul that he did. He said, God, that will not take place. He says this in verse 31. Simon, Simon, Satan is asked to have all of you to sift you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen and build up your brothers. Stop right there. He was talking. He said, man, I, I will never leave you. I will never deny you. I'll never make the mistake. And Jesus says, buddy, you don't, you don't understand. Satan himself has said, I'm going to attack. I'm going to sift you like wheat. In other words, I am going to put your life on a sifter. And I'm going to shake that sifter. And the purities will fall through. But the impurities will stay on top. And the impurities, the issues of life, will stay on top. And I will attack everything that is not pure within your life. And Jesus was saying to Peter, I am going to have Satan sift you. You are going to look, and he is going to be able to see all the impurities, all the failures, all the arrogance. And that arrogance, that egotism, that is what is going to be attacked. And Satan is going to have his way with you. Jesus, at that time, could have said, you know what, but I'm going to stop him from doing it. I'm going to take you out of Satan's sifting plan, and I'm going to put you on the side. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pray for you. I'm not going to supernaturally keep you from it. But while you're in the middle of it, I'm going to pray that you will not lose your faith, and you are not going to fail me. And when you are sifted and you have repented, I pray that you will come back and you will minister and love the brethren that are going to go through the same issues that you go through. Have we ever been sifted by Satan? Oh, yeah. Have we ever figured out what our failures are? And when we do know what our failures are, we know that Satan comes down to us, and he attacks us in our weakest moments, in our failures, and in our fears. That's exactly what Jesus said that Satan is going to do to Peter. And he says, I'm going to pray for you. And when you fail... Jesus has never been wrong. He lived for 33 years. He has never been wrong. Verse 33, Peter said, Lord, I am ready to go to prison with you and even die with you. How easy is it when you're in the midst of the Lord or you're at church on Sunday morning or you're in an environment that everybody expects you to be godly Everybody expects you to do the right thing. I will die for you. I'll go to prison for you. And Jesus shakes his head. Because he could stand up in the face of adversity with the Lord, 
But as soon as God, or as soon as the Lord is out of us, is out of our environment, how easy it is to fail away and to fall. But Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. The rooster will crow tomorrow morning until you have denied me three times and you know me to be true. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you to preach the good news and you did not have money and travel bag or extra clothing, did you lack for anything? And they said, no. But now he said, take your money and travel bag and you will have and you have, don't have the sword, sell your clothes and buy one. In other words, it's going to get tough. Life is going to be hurting. It's going to be very difficult for you to live if you live for my sake. People are going to hate you. People are going to hurt you. Be prepared to stand and fight. Jesus knows tomorrow he's going to be crucified. He knows that the core, the apostles are going to be left alone to start what we know as the church. And they have to have power. They have to know that there's something more significant than just the identity and just the power of Jesus in their presence. They have to know that the Holy Spirit of God is going to work within their life. So when you look at commitment, what was the downward trend of Peter's denial? The first stage, he became distant. Peter followed from a distance. He followed from a distance. There was a time in Peter's life where he was so vivacious and so outgoing and so in tune with God and in tune with Jesus, he wanted to stand beside him. He was at the Mount of the Transfiguration. He was deep in the heart of the Garden of Gethsemane. He was right beside Jesus every step of the way. And he was strong when he was beside Jesus. But once the distance happened, he became weak. The first stage, you follow from a distance. It hinders our vision. It hinders the power and the ability that we have to stand for God. The st second stage, his fellowship became divided. Peter sat among the soldiers. The very ones that arrested him, now Peter is sitting with them. Things happen. It got cold. So instead of standing with Jesus, he warmed himself by the fire beside the people that hated Jesus. And it's very easy to start that downward trend of denial when we're not face to face and in a relationship with God. The divided. You started doing things with people that are anti God. We start finding ourselves doing things that are like anti God. The fellowship became divided. And then his faith became diluted. Diluted. But he denied him saying, I don't even know him. You know, it's easy when you're thinking about standing in front of people and maybe you're proclaiming a message and there's, there's people around you, your family and your friends that you go to church with or that know you're a faith follower and and it's easy to stand up for God. But what about that time where things happen and you're alone with somebody that maybe hates God? He may be an agnostic or maybe he's an atheist and they just do not believe the same way that you do. And they ask simple questions about what faith is to you or what does the Bible say here? Or what would you believe here? And you have a decision to make. Do you make that decision of, I will stand up for God? Or you say, you know what, I really don't want them to not to like me. So I will water down what I believe just to make them like me. We become deluded. We don't stand up for our faith because we're afraid of what people will say about our faith. So whenever we become divided, it's very easy for the next stage to become deluded. We're, we're not strong enough. We're not faithful enough. We want to walk close enough to be called a Christian, but far enough away not to be a Christian. We don't want to live that life, so what we do is we become deluded. And then the fervor became denial. 
with swearing and cursing. He was so afraid of what he thought, what the soldiers were going to do to him, he flat out denied. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are saying. You're crazy. I will not be a follower of Jesus. For the last three years, it wasn't me that walked beside him. I don't even know the man. He flat out denied his faith. He flat out denied his faith. He became distant, divided, deluded, and then it was denial. See, when you get to that point, over the last three hours in the courtyard, when Jesus was being mocked, punched, spit upon, laughed at, the love that Peter had became fear that captivated him. And the fear that captivated turned and said, I love him. I want him. But I'm scared to death for my life because we start walking away. I love him. I love God. I know that he died on the cross for my sins. I know what I should do. But everything within me in this culture says that if I follow after him, I will not be accepted. I'll be hurt. I'll be belittled. So what we try to do is we try to make a dividing line to say, I will play the game, but I will not have the real thing. And Peter, he had a line in the sand drawn, and he crossed that line. And as soon as he crossed that line... I believe takes place with you and takes place with me. We may not have the physical eyes of Jesus that penetrates our soul, but we have the Holy Spirit of God that lives within our soul. And when we cross that line of denial or sin, I believe inwardly we feel the presence of God penetrating our soul, and it's called conviction. And when we have the penetrating eyes of the Holy Spirit that convicts us of our soul, we do the same thing that Peter did when Peter looked at Jesus and Jesus looked at him intently within his eyes. He left that courtyard and he went out and he wept bitterly because he had failed God. Failed him. Not just hurt him. He denied that he even knew him. What do you do with that commitment? What do you do with Jesus? What do you do with what Jesus did? So in the middle of my sermon right here, I want to show you a clip. It's a video clip of the skit guys. And then I want to talk to you after this about how Jesus restores us to where he wants us to go. So let's watch this video clip called Grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor for us, his crazy love. And the truth is, many times we struggle understanding it. If you find yourself struggling to understand God's grace, don't beat yourself up. Even the disciples struggled with understanding grace. Jesus, is that you? You're alive. I can't believe you're alive. Okay, I was in the boat, and I wasn't catching any fish, okay? But I heard this voice, and the voice said, cast your net to the other side. And so I'm thinking, I'm a fisherman. I know what I'm doing, but I'm not catching any fish, you know? And so I throw that net over there, and then a gaggle of fish pop into that net, and I'm going, this is a total miracle. Who could have done that? I need to know who told me to throw the net to the other side. And boom, I look up, and I mean, there is you. You're looking at me on the seashore going, it is I, the Lord, and you're alive. I can't believe you're alive. This is awesome. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on. Peter, yeah. do you love me? Yes, I love you. I love you. You're alive. This is so great. Good, and, then feed my sheep. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on, man. It's him. Peter, Yeah. do you love me? I love you, yes. And I'm so sorry about that rooster clucking. I had no idea what that meant, but I do not. I'm better for it, all right? Okay. Then feed my sheep. Andrew, I'm smiling, but I'm serious. Come on, get out of the boat. It's him. Peter, Yeah. do you love me? Jesus, mere words cannot describe the passion that I have for you. I love you. You know everything. I love you. Good. Good. Then feed my sheep. I didn't even know you had livestock. 
that are so like you, though. There's something new about you all the time. That's what I love about you. Peter, yeah. do you remember uh, the morning the ladies went to the tomb? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're all in the upper room trying to figure out what to do next, you know, because we thought you were dead. You know, you were dead, you know, and we're trying to figure all that out, you know. And Mary comes running up, and Mary's like saying, beehive, beehive, beehive. And I'm thinking, I'm allergic to bees. Like, keep them out. You know what I'm saying? But as she kept getting closer, I heard her correctly. She was saying, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And we're going, who's alive, who's alive? And she said, she was at the tomb, and the tomb was empty, and she said that the, there was an angel there, and the angel said, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay, he is risen. And so, me and John, we hightailed it down there, and if John says he beat me, he's totally lying, all right? I beat him, FYI, all right, you know? And we get down there, and I'm looking in that tomb, and it is, it is empty. There's nothing in there, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, what does this mean? What does this mean? And John is right there. John is so good with words. He should write a book. He is so good with words. And John said, don't you get it, Peter? This is everything Jesus said he was going to do, and you did it, and it's done. Let's go. This is so great. Wait, yeah. the angel said what? Uh, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay. He is risen. You've risen. Let's go. This he is said what? Go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. You said my name. Why did you say my name? Peter, that's grace. No, no, I don't, I don't deserve that because that night people kept coming up to me asking me if I belonged to you, if I was with you, and I kept denying you left and right, all right? No, it'll take me my whole life to make up for what I did. It was unforgivable for no, what I did. No, What I did on the cross was meant to take what is unforgivable and make it forgivable. That's my grace. It's not about you. It's always about me. That's grace, Peter. In the midst of our biggest failures, we get to experience the greatest gift, and that's grace. Because we've all been like the disciple Peter. We've all failed miserably. We've all said, I've done too much. I've gone too far. I've denied. I've deluded. I've even divided my faith. Sometimes we even deny that we even want to be a believer in Christ. But every time that we do that, because we are so loved by God, He gives us the greatest gift, and that's grace. He gives to us what we do not deserve, not because anything that we have done. It's all because what he has done. When I saw that video for the first time, I thought, that's exactly the way I feel. There's many times where I feel I do not deserve being a pastor. I don't deserve the blessings of God. And he said something in that video, it's not biblical, it's just spiritual. He said, it's not about you. It's always about me. You live your life for me. Yeah, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to fail. But just as Jesus told Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Take care of my lambs. Three times Peter denied Jesus. Three times Jesus restored him, restored him to the place of competency, restored him to a place where he knows that Jesus loves him. There's times within our life, issues within our heart, that we feel that we've gone too far and Jesus will reject us. So we feel that we cannot have the love and the forgiveness of God. So we live our life in defeat because of failures of our past. And if we live our life in defeat because of the failures of our past, we're not experiencing the grace and the forgiveness of God. That is the greatest thing that God has given to us. We see the downward trend of Peter. We see that he failed, but we see that Jesus can restore. So where is it that we can look at the different levels of Jesus in his life? The first one, the first level is come and see. The curiosity level. The curiosity level. Come and see. When Jesus is talking 
to us. And he's trying to get us to make a commitment to him. He says, just come and see. Just come and see what I can do. Just allow me to work within your life. The curiosity stage. When Jesus was calling his disciples, he just says, come and see. Let me show you what you can be. So in the word of God, when we look at what Jesus wants to do within your life and with life around you, it's to come and see. It's not about you. It's about him. Our job is to point others to see him. Come and see. See what Jesus can do within their life and your life. And after that curiosity stage, it comes to say, come and follow. This is the commitment level. Come and follow. There's times that we come and see and understand what Jesus can do, but there's a time within our life when Jesus supernaturally gets into our life and he says, no longer can you play the social gospel. Now I'm asking you to make a commitment. I'm asking you to be a follower of me, to be my disciple. It's not easy. There may be sacrifice. There may be time spent, money given, ministry opportunities in front of you. Are we committed to Jesus? And there's no way that we will be committed to Jesus if we have diluted and divided our faith to him without the forgiveness and the grace restored unto us. We cannot live in the failures of our past and be committed to Christ in our future. There has to be a point when I say I am committed, that means nothing else matters. I am committed. I am committed to the one that saved me. I am committed to the one that loves me. I am committed to the one that forgave me. And if we understand that Jesus says, just come and see me. And then I want you to be committed to me. And then he comes, come and surrender. That is conviction. Surrender. I give up. It's not about me. It's about him. And after we are convicted, and after we have committed ourselves to him, he says, surrender. Surrender your will, not your ways, but his ways. An opportunity to minister, an opportunity to go through life, opportunities to see things from his perspective. I have given my life to Jesus. He died on the cross for my sins. I understand that I have been given that gift of forgiveness, and I know that if I accept him as my Lord and Savior, I die and I go to heaven. I am so excited about that. I am committed to Jesus, not because of me. I'm committed to Jesus because of what he has done. But so often the church and so often in our lives, we live a life that is in defeat because of our failure, we are not living in the presence of grace and forgiveness. So we are not committed to our future. We are not convicted to follow. We will not surrender because we do not have the proper perspective of what God wants to do through your life. We are not called by God to come to church on Sunday morning. That is not the epitome of of our faith. That is not the overwhelming desire of a Christ follower is to come to church. The overwhelming desire of a Christ follower is to be surrendered to whatever he wants us to do. It's to minister in our pain, in our failures, in when we are sifted. We come out pure on the bottom, but on top of that sift, we see our weaknesses. We see our failures. And that's when we say, Lord, I need your help in those areas. I come out clean on the bottom. And I know I love you down here. But that stuff that's on top, where Satan can see my weaknesses and my arrogance and Satan can see my failures, that's where he's going to attack. God, I need your help with those areas. Because if I don't get your help with those areas... I'm going to fail daily in those areas. I need to surrender my failures. I need to surrender my life to his will. And he does it in weird ways. 
He does it in ways that he doesn't just call us on the phone and says, I want you to do this or I want you to do that. He puts life, real life, in the face. And he says, if you surrender, I'm going to give you opportunities to break open and to allow those pains, those insecurities, and those failures to be broken up, to fall through that sift, so they'll be ready to be called righteousness. How do we do that? What did Peter do? Peter was sifted by Satan. And in doing that, he went out and he wept bitterly, cried openly that he failed God. God started work within his life. And then the Bible says, when you have repented, encourage your brothers. When you've been sifted, and Satan starts working on your weak areas of your life and your failures of your life, and you repent of those things, restore your brother. We all have stuff, junk, stuff that God has done within our life that sometimes we even get mad at God at. Why did I have to go through that? Why am I dealing with that? God, why didn't you just take that from me and move me away from that? Why am I having to go through all this junk and all this stuff within my life? Why don't you just get rid of it? And God is saying this. You would have never learned if I got rid of it. I'm going to make you better with it when you give it to me. There's always opportunities, fears. And sometimes with the deepest hurts and the hardest memories, sometimes the hardest time within your life where you even get mad at God, God will say, I love you. But he won't let us stay where we were he wants to use what we went through to help others for what they're going through. And we may rebel against it and hate every second leading up to it. But we see the hand of God working while we do it. Very difficult. Difficult to a point where Thursday morning... At 6 o'clock, we had a, a family, Jessica and Kevin Self, and their family was in the delivery room. And uh, the little baby, Emily Grace, uh, has a disease that's not supposed to live more than minutes or hours. But she's doing wonderful, and, and she's, she's lived over three or four days. And, and they're, they're, it, it's still very sad. But during the, one of the hardest areas of our life, the Thomas family, was when we lost our little girl. And I hated it. I hated God for it, and I was so struggling with it. And I don't know how many times over the last 20 years that we've been in the hospital with somebody that's losing their baby, whether it's through, through, uh, through a disease or just a miscarriage. And, and I look back at that moment of time of our loss, that overwhelming anger and fear of my own personal loss. But then I see Kevin sitting out there with tears down his eyes. The empathy that I have for him, he, have no, he has no idea what he is going to go through, but I can come up beside him and love him and say, you know what? I know it hurts, but I know God's going to be beside you. When you have been sifted, and when you have gone through junk within your life, when you have fears, when the catastrophic has happened within your own life, and God deals with you and loves you and gets you through that event, go help your brother. That's exactly what Jesus told Peter. Go help your brother. Don't let your pain remain your pain. Let your pain become somebody else's gain. By walking beside them, by loving them through that, 
by knowing it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt to the core. It's going to hurt you so much that you're going to wish you were dead. But let God strengthen you. And as he strengthens you, strengthen others. That is when you called to surrender. That it's not about you. It's about letting God work through you. And if we allow God to work through us, we come to that last point, level four, is come and multiply. This is the commission level. God allows things, a stair step within your life, just to come and see. Come see what he can do. Surrender your life. And then once we have surrendered our life and we allow the vehicle of life to allow God to work within us and he sees within our life that he can put you in a place of your pain, but you helped. Your fears, but you have been forgiven. And you can offer that empathy and that love to somebody else. What we have come is we've come to the point that we can multiply we can multiply spiritually. We are being called aside to do something great. Peter went out and he wept bitterly. He put his face before God and he said, God, I am wrong. Jesus restored him three times. But now he's restored. Forty days later, he preaches the day of Pentecost and thousands come to know Christ. A man that wanted to die. A man that went out and wept bitterly. A man that denied Christ preaches a message and thousands of people have given their life to Christ. Why? He came to a point and he said, it is not about me. It's about what God can do through me. And if we get to the point in our life, we look at the obstacles and the situations and the failures and our fears the problems that we have, and we surrender them and say, I know, I hate it. I know that I struggle. But Lord, they have to be yours. Because if they're mine, I'm going to fail you. I'm going to fail you miserably. But if we give them our fears, our failures, our sins to God. He can work through them. And on the other side, we can be called to multiply, to give our life to others so they can see Christ in us. There's not a greater scripture in the Bible than Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, what's the last part? I am always with you, even to the end of the age. When we know that I can teach others what God has done for me, salvation, my weaknesses, I can share with them through the love and the forgiveness of God and I know that God is going to be with me with evangelism, with life issues. I will be with you always. When we feel like we're alone, when we feel like the junk is too much for us, we feel like nobody understands, we feel like the whole world is capsized and I'm underwater and I am drowning. Lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. That's what Jesus does for us. I can understand the disciple Peter. I can relate to that. I can relate all day long to the fears of my failures. But what I need to grab a hold of is the promises of God. Because when I look at what God wants to do through my weaknesses, I can see that God can use me when I get out of the way. When the Bible says that Peter 
after he was looked into Jesus' eyes. He bowed his head. He went by himself and whipped openly, unashamedly, crying to God. And once he asked God to forgive him because of his failure, that's when his whole life turned. Go tell the disciples and Peter. He thought he was written off. He thought he was done. He thought he would never be able to communicate the love and the forgiveness of God again. Go tell the disciples and Peter that I'm alive and I want to see him. Have you ever been to the point where you feel like nobody wants you or you sin so bad that you don't think God will ever forgive you? What would it sound like if Jesus says, and go tell Steve Hoover to come to me? You know what that does to Steve's heart? Really? You love me enough that you're going to forgive me? And we have to remember, if we're going to have a commitment to God, we are committed to him when we mess up or when we're on the top of the mountain. When we feel like our family's a failure or we feel like everything's wonderful. When we feel like there's travesties and craziness going on in our life or we feel like everything's wonderful. We feel like our kids or we do have our kids. Maybe get a phone call and maybe there's a major disease within their life. And we don't know if they're going to live tomorrow. Can we give God the glory in the midst of that? That's what commitment's all about. See, in church, sometimes we think commitment is coming to church on Sunday morning at 1030. I'm committed to God. <laughs> That's not commitment. That's worship. Commitment is on a daily basis. Can we take our failures and our fears and give them to God so God can work through our weaknesses and give him the glory. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we come before you and we use your story, the story of your crucifixion, the story of the events leading up to the worst day of your life, but the greatest thing that you've ever done to die on the cross to redeem mankind from their sins. And we take a subplot of that, a subplot of you being on trial and you died on the cross, a subplot of a man that looked at his own life instead of looking at your life, looking how it affected him instead of how you wanted to deal with him. So Lord, I pray that today through this invitation, that those failures, those weaknesses, the sifting issue that stays on top instead of falls through, that we can come out and weep and know that we will never become the person you want us to be until we give the impurities, the failures back to you. And once we give those back to you, you will make them, break them, mold them, to allow them to be righteousness. Allow them to go through the sifting process because they are sifted through you and not used by Satan. And Lord, I ask you now, just as we all have our fears, we all have our issues, I pray that just like you did with Peter, that you intently looked into his eyes and the rooster crowed that you will deeply look into our souls through the Holy Spirit of God and you'll break us where we failed you. You'll bring us to a place that we love you enough that we will give up, we will surrender our life to multiply your life. Lord, break us. Use us. Allow us to be a vessel that can be used in your life.